Free will versus ownership, this is going to be part four, and we've been reading from this booklet written by Dr. Stephen Jones, this all-important topic. And last time when we left off, we had just mentioned that if God initiates the action and man responds by his human will, then God is still God. But if God is the responder, then man is his own God. And the Creator is His powerful but obedient servant. And that's just not the case, ladies and gentlemen. So we can only respond. Our will can only respond to what the Spirit of God already initiates or puts into motion. Jeremiah had something to say about this. Jeremiah 31.18 says in the Interlinear Bible, I have surely heard Ephraim moaning over himself saying, you have chastised me, and I was chastised as a bull not broken in. Turn me, and I shall be turned, for you are Jehovah my God. By the Spirit, Jeremiah compares Ephraim to a bullock plowing a field as if praying to his master to turn him in another direction. To turn means to repent, to go in another direction. But the bull cannot turn unless the master turns him. In other words, the farmer is the one responsible to turn the bull in the right direction as it is plowing the field. This particular bull is the tribe of Ephraim, Deuteronomy 33, 17. God is clearly shown to be at the reins, so to speak. He is the one in control of the bullock. So Jeremiah is showing that God has to initiate everything. You get that, ladies and gentlemen? God is the initiator, the creator, the owner, the one who's liable. Otherwise, it will not be accomplished. The bullock then, by his own will, responds to the will of his master. Jeremiah 17, 14 also tells us, Heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved, for thou art my praise. Once again, the prophet shows us that God initiates the action. None of us will be saved unless God has done something first to initiate man's response. And you know, you think about it, it's by grace through faith that we are saved. But the faith is really only a response to a revelation of the grace. So remember that. No man can come to the Father except the Father drag him. Wow, it's hard to get past that one, ladies and gentlemen. No man can come to the Father except the Father drag him. Oh God, then drag us, Lord. Drag us to know you. If God has ordained some event from the beginning... Call it predestination, if you want, the P word. If he has determined something and ordained it, then it is going to happen. But it will seem as if it happened naturally or by the will of man. Again, who is the cause and what is the effect? Man's flesh cannot initiate any good thing. Sorry. In my flesh is no good thing. Romans 7.18 James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above. One of the greatest gifts God can give us is the gift of repentance. Romans 2.4, That the kindness of God leads you to repentance. So once again, it takes God to initiate for us to even be able to repent and turn to Him. If God leads us to repent and begins to drag us to the Father, then we should stop giving our human will so much credit for repenting. We should praise and thank God for giving us this good and perfect gift. If God does not turn us, which causes us to respond by turning to Him, there is no way that we will even want to believe in Him. Thus, the very fact that you have a desire in your heart to know God is proof that God has already done something in your heart. There is no need to doubt or wonder if God has really called you. Of course He has called you. Otherwise, you would have no interest in knowing God or even in reading a book like this. 
If God drags you to himself and reveals himself to you, causing you to turn to him, is this response done by your free will? Man would always like to take credit for his turning to God, his acceptance of Jesus Christ as his Savior, as if his salvation is based upon his own free will decision. To many theologians, this is the only thing that gives salvation any legitimacy. They believe that if God exercises his will or interferes in any way with man's decision to come to God, then somehow this goes against the nature of God. But that theology is only a philosophy of man, for there is no scripture that teaches this. The term free will does not even appear in the scripture. Hear it again. The term free will does not even appear in the scripture. It is only a tradition of men. 1 John 1, 11 through 12 says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Thus far it sounds like man has free will. But then John continues in verse 13. Which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. When we're born again, we're not born of blood, or of flesh, or of the will of man. We're born of the will of God. It's the will of God that's taken over in our lives at that point. It is not the will of the flesh. It is not the will of man. It is not blood lineage. It is done only by the will of God. Of all the gospel writers, John makes the clearest case for God's sovereignty. Was John unaware of the debate over free will? No, for this issue was debated just as hotly in his day as it, it is in ours. There were three Judean schools of thought in those days. The Essenes believed that God was totally sovereign. The Sadducees believed that man had total free will. The Pharisees were in the middle believing that God helps people to do good. These same schools of thought have come down to us today, and the debate has continued in every seminary. God does all things by the counsel of his own will, Ephesians 1.11 says, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. God works all things after the counsel of of his own will. To absolve God of any responsibility for evil in the world, many Christian theologians today feel the need to take back most of God's sovereignty. First, they attribute the sovereignty to God, and then they take it all back and give most of it to the devil and to man. Let's hear that again. First, they attribute the sovereignty to God, and then they take it all back and give most of it to the devil and to man. How many times have you heard Christians say, Oh, God's in control. Oh, God's all powerful. Oh, God knows the end from the beginning. He's all knowing. He's all loving. He's all present. He's everything. But then they say, It's all up to you. It's all up to your choice. So, they like to say God is sovereign, but then they take all of it back. And then they preach their free moral agency gospel and say, well, we know the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. He won't actually be the Savior of the world because it's really up to man to save himself. And they miss the whole point of the sovereignty of God, the plan of God, that it is God who does the drawing or the dragging. He gives us the gift of faith to believe and to repent and to respond to him. And we're just responding to something that he's already done. Most of Christianity wants to teach this free will, free moral agency, wants to give all the credit to man so they can also teach this eternal hell that makes no sense and then try to say, well, none of it's God's fault because it's all the fault of man and his free will and his free moral agency. 
Not so, ladies and gentlemen. Free will, when taken to its logical conclusion, removes all sovereignty from God, leaving him totally impotent to do anything but stand on the sidelines and threaten people with ever-increasing punishment. He stands there in hopes and hopes and hopes that somebody will listen, but he is impotent to actually do anything. Little wonder, then, that so many Christians live in fear of the devil rather than by faith in God. While they express faith in God with their lips, they go home believing that God is in serious need of help to accomplish his goals on earth. They might as well just go on and say, poor God, he's trying his best. Adam brought the whole creation down, but Jesus Christ is trying, he's giving it everything he's got, and this devil out there just got out of control and wanted to strike up a war against him and is trying to defeat him, and we're just got to hold our breath and see what's going to happen, and we just got to see who's going to make it in the end and see how many God can get back, because his hands are tied, he's a gentleman, he can't do anything to influence the will of man. Baloney! God's not a gentleman. God is God. He's all-powerful. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's sovereign, almighty love, and he has a plan, and he has a creation's jubilee in store for everyone who's ever lived. He's not going to be a gentleman when it comes to revealing himself to mankind and destroying sin and wickedness. God is going to destroy the sin in my life, your life. He's going to destroy the wicked. And the way that he's going to do that is to destroy their wickedness in them where they are no longer his enemy, but they are reconciled and made friendly to him. You got it? All this baloney about God being a gentleman and he can't do this and he can't do that. No. God has set up a plan and he's going to bring it to pass. Ask Pharaoh if God was a gentleman. Ask Jonah if God was a gentleman. Ask Saul if God was a gentleman. No, he invaded their lives and revealed himself. He said, hey Saul, you're going about killing Christians. I'm going to turn you into a man who's known by the name of Paul and you're a chosen vessel. And you're going to turn the world upside down. You're going to write most of the New Testament. You're going to be one of the greatest men of God who has ever lived. And I'm just going to sovereignly reveal myself to you. And then what was he going to do? Was he going to say, at that point, was Paul just going to say, well, let me check in with my free moral agency and I'll get back with you, Jesus. No, the resurrected Jesus appeared to him. What would you do? What would I do? You're going to say, yes, Lord. Yes, I'm coming to you. And that's what God does. He reveals himself. You see, and the two biggest idols really in the church today are free moral agency, the worship of free will and free moral agency. And this one's going to shock you here. Christians worshiping the devil. Yes, I said it. They worship the devil. They say the devil this, the devil that, the devil's going to do this. We got to fight the devil. Da, 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 da. They don't even realize God created Satan. God created the devil. The serpent was the most subtle beast of the field which the Lord God had made. God has made him for a purpose. He is a tool in his toolbox. Jesus Christ created all things, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And Paul told us that we wrestle against principalities and powers. That means that Jesus Christ has created things for us to wrestle against. He's in control of it. He's the one that created it and has made it antagonistic. He's the one who will reconcile it and make it friendly in the end. We've got to see God in this light and in this way. He creates light. He creates darkness. He creates good and evil. He is the God of gods. There's no power outside of him. All power is of God. We have to see him this way if we're going to mature in the kingdom of God. Most people spend all their time talking about the devil and the free will of man and free moral agency. 
They're not going to the one who's at the top. They're spending all their time going to middle management when they need to go bypass the middle management and go to the top. God is the one running it. He's the one running his kingdom. He works all things according to the counsel of his own will. This is our God. This is the one we need to see who has a plan to save all mankind.